those who haven't heard the presentation this morning by Michel Cooper, uh, this uh, talk is going to uh, take the data from the National Geochemical Survey of Australia, which was completed uh, for about 12 months ago, and uh, present some of the preliminary uh, statistical processing of the data that uh, Eric and I have been working on over the last uh, few months. Uh, the National Geochemical Survey of Australia could not have been possible without the collaboration of all the states, uh, which we are acknowledged here by uh, showing the paper on the title slide, who uh, greatly assisted the, uh, the, the sampling phase, especially of, uh, of, uh, of this, uh, this project. The structure of my talk is uh, represented at the, at the bar at the top here, so I'll start with an introduction just briefly, a couple of slides to show you what, uh, what we intended to do and what we uh, ended up doing. Um, the landscape of Australia was divided into large uh, catchment. The idea was to collect one sample per catchment at the bottom of these catchments that represented the contribution of all the weathered rocks and soils uh, up, upland from that sampling pond. So uh, we started with this hydrological uh, division of the, of the continent. Uh, we aimed to have catchments that were about sea alive. Um, but we aim to have catchments that were about 5,000 square kilometers in, in size. Uh, the reason was that we had finite budget and finite amount of time to carry out this project, which at the time was about five years, four, four years really. And um, we decided, or we found out that we could deal with about 1,500 something sites at most. So that's what we ended up with. Uh, oh, at least, yeah, we. The, the, the aim was to uh, sample all these catchments, which would have afforded us a coverage of 91% of the country. Um, and uh, I, I also want to say that the emphasis on the project from conceptualization to reporting was uh, very much on quality control and quality assessment uh, with, a, with a large report uh, dealing with that. If you keep your eye on the catchments here, you will see how our target sites uh, were derived. Again. And this is uh, what we actually ended up sampling. So the, the catchments in yellow were the ones that were sampled. Uh, the total was about 1,200 catchments, um, and 123 of these were sampled in duplicate, so a little bit more than a 10% uh, field uh, duplicate quality control. And six other large catchments were sampled the second time, not at the outlet of the lower point, but somewhere higher up, because they were uh, anonymously large, I guess. Uh, this gave us a sampling density of about one sample per 5,200 square kilometers, which is similar to the uh, forex atlas that had been published a few years before. And we sampled 86% of the catchment that we aimed to sample, and this represented 6.2 million square kilometers of uh, the country, or about 81%. Uh, so why do we have this hole here in Western Australia and the uh, uh, western part of South Australia? It's essentially due to uh, not being able to get access to the land uh, in order to complete the sampling. And we hope that this will still be done for the next few months or years. Uh, maybe. This is a typical uh, sample uh, site in, this, in the Northern Territory, I believe. So we were, we were uh, targeting flood plain uh, or overbank sediments, and we were collecting uh, samples from several uh, overhauls or from the surface, as you will see in the next slide, which is really a summary of how we produced, uh, how, how we carried out the geochemical survey. So here shown in a profile, we took a top outlet sediment, or TOS, which represents a depth of 0 to 10 centimeters, so that's uh, collected from a shallow pit and mixed to uh, account for the local and natural heterogeneity of the soils. And the deeper sample was called bottom outlet sediment, or BOSS, and also collected <coughs> from several overhauls to, for the same reason. And on average, uh, it uh, was collected from 60 to 80 centimeters depth. We did some field testing for pH, as shown here. We also re uh, reported the uh, months of color in the field and some other uh, observations. We took some photographs, EPS coordinates, etc., as you would expect. Back in the laboratory, the, all the samples were treated at Geoscience Australia in the same place. Uh, the samples were air dried and homogenized. And after this stage, we split them in half using a ritual split, uh, shown here. Uh, half the sample was uh, put into archive for future analyses, and the other half was used for uh, the chemical analysis and the other analyses that we did uh, for this project. Uh, so we, we had a bulk fraction on which we measured things like PS125, EC125, electrical conductivity 125, and other properties, grain size distribution, and so on. 
Then we had two sieve fractions, less than two millimeters and less than 75 microns, which we call the coarse and the fine fractions, respectively. And all these, so we have two depths, two grain size fractions, that's four samples per site, about 1,300 sites, so it's almost 6,000 samples that were analyzed. And not only that, we, only did, we also did three geochemical digestion of each sample, so that's 18,000 results. <coughs> Uh, so we had a total analysis, which, re which represented less than 2 millimeters or the less than 75 micron fraction in total, done by XRF or total digest by CPMS. We had a strong but yet partial uh, digest uh, vacua region, and then a much weaker uh, MMI, mobile metal ion uh, digest, which uh, is subject of one of the posts that's up today. So for the purpose of this uh, presentation here, the data analysis, we took all the, we concentrated on the total contents <coughs> of the XRF and ICPMS. We excluded some of the elements for which we are not too happy with the, uh, the representativity or the detection limit issues, and we ended up with 50 chemical elements listed here, plus loss on ignition, which is an indication of uh, organic matter and carbonate, etc. This was obtained on the four samples, as I mentioned. And for the data that was censored or missing, we used the neural networks to uh, impute, type or impute the, uh, uh, the values. Now, uh, the data was then transformed using the centered log ratio to uh, uh, circumvent the closure problem. And uh, after that, uh, principal component analysis was carried out in producing the spirit plot bad plots and rust maps, which you will see in the, the coming slides. Now, in the forthcoming slides and uh, maps in particular, you will see these subdivisions of the surface of the continent, which is based on a regular map showing different uh, polygons of uh, fresh to weathered rock, transported cover, etc. Won't need to dwell too much on these results. Um, this is a typical screen plot that shows you the, the variance that's represented by the, the successive uh, principal components. So the first one is quite a lot more representative of a lot more variance than. Uh, PC2 and 3 and 4, for example, and then the higher, uh, the higher level principal components explain less and less of the variance, and probably this means that they are representative of more confused and less clear uh, processes. We're going to focus on the first four principal components in the rest of this uh, presentation. They account for 55% uh, or so of the total variance. Now, this is a bi-plot, uh, PC1 on the x-axis and PC2 on the y-axis. And just to show you uh, how, how, how these things have come out, you have all the samples here shown by these uh, symbols, so the toss and boss, both fine and coarse. And you see the clustering of these, uh, of these elements. The further away they are from the origin, the more important uh, they are to uh, represent, the, represent the principal component and hopefully uh, as an explanation of processes that are taking place. And what I wanted to point out here is in PC1, the positive loadings of PC1 are highly represented by rare earth elements, uh, zirconium and uh, rare earth element, uh, look -like, uh, elements, if you like. And so if another way of looking at these loadings is uh, to rank them per principal component. You have the negative scores of PC1, for example, are represented by calcium, magnesium, copper, nickel, strontium, etc. And the positive scores are these rare earth elements that I showed. And you can see how strong this signal is uh, by the extent of these bars here compared to just about any other bar in the other principal components. So what I suggest to do now for the rest of the time is to go over the first four principal components, show you the maps that come from these, uh, from uh, uh, rust, rust rising these uh, principal components and relate them to some other geoscience data sets that uh, we hope provide an explanation for why these uh, patterns are the way they are. And just a summary table, uh, as I said, we'll go through these one by one. Uh, just like to point out, PC3 here is an excellent uh, felsic versus matrix uh, discriminator. So looking at the PC1, which you can see here, so this is a toss fine grain uh, mm -hmm. samples. Uh, we have negative loadings, which are represented by magnesium, calcium, etc. And we insert these to be the, therefore a representative of carbonates and iron lag or iron viral crust at the surface. And so these, they are represented by cool colors, as they will on all the other maps as well. And you can see, for example, that the uh, nuclear base in the Yilgan uh, region are characterized by these, low, by these high negative loadings. And if you look at the Aster ferric oxide map content, uh, which was released actually uh, just yesterday officially at uh, this conference, you can see that they correspond to high ferric uh, values 
in these two regions. Conversely, the positive loadings for PC1 are, as I said before, highly representative of the rare earth elements and the associated elements. Uh, and they are interpreted to indicate uh, an abundance of resistant minerals, zircons, etc., and uh, an indication of intense weathering processes. These are represented by the warmer colors of this ring. And for example, if you look at the uh, uh, um, Kepio Peninsula, you can correspond this, for example, to the Storium channel of the Ebo and Radio Matrix. You see some very good correspondence here, and as well the area in the southern northern territory here. PC2, uh, negative loadings, uh, europium, cobalt, zinc, manganese, magnesium, etc., which we interpret to represent sediments and other weather um, areas. It's a little bit of a confused uh, loading in my mind at this stage, I'm not quite sure, or I want to work a little bit more on it. But the positive loadings uh, are represented by silicon and germanium, which uh, behave geochemically uh, uh, quite strongly together in this uh, data set. And then again, some zirconium and uh, uh, minerals and elements that represent heavy minerals, for example. So we think that this is a good representation of quartz rich sand and zircons again representing the high weathering. Here we compare this to uranium uh, air, air, air radiometric channel, and here the silica index of this aster coverage that I mentioned before. So we have a good correspondence here, and uh, as well in the Lake Air region of Central Australia. PC3, uh, basically that's the one that represents quite well the phasic versus mafic uh, end members. Just to show you some of the phasic rocks that are shown on the surface map, surface geological map of Australia, and also some uh, bedrock, um, uh, bedrock map or solid geology map of the large nearest pro provinces, which corresponds really well to these uh, uh, positive loadings, and this is a this is a mafic to ultramafic uh, bed that contains chromite. And again, ferric oxide is a good proper representation with the positive loadings of this uh, component. And now, since we're running out of time, I won't really show too much on PC4, but it's, you got, I think you got the message that we find good correspondence between uh, the principal components, how they're distributed, and some other geoscience data sets that are in, uh, independent. So, in conclusion, uh, the NGSA data was uh, sent, uh, the sensor of NGSA data was included, the data was seen and <coughs> transformed, and the uh, principal component analysis was uh, carried out. Uh, the four principal components account for 54% of the variance, and the maps, uh, the creep maps of the principal components, have uh, good correspondence with uh, independent geoscience data sets such as the surface geology of Australia, the solid geology. Uh, the radio, airborne radiometrics and the new newly released mineral, mineral maps uh, from Aster. So the geochemical signature of surface regolith as we sampled it is obviously dominated by rock and regolith types and catchments. And the data identifies multi-element geochemical signature of various large-scale regions, uh, previously undocumented from a geochemical, geochemical point of view. And as I said, this is a, this is a preliminary uh, report on our, on our work. We're continuing this uh, uh, statistical analysis of this data, and we hope to uh, come up with uh, some de uh, demonstrated association between the geochemical signature with different processes in the bedrock uh, or in the cover, including things like weathering and lithology, etc. Uh, I'd just like to thank all the people who uh, collaborated in the NGSA, including all the sampling teams for the uh, state of the survey, even the lab, and the other researchers that have been involved in this. Uh, thank you for your attention. Do you have time for a couple of questions? Please. How stable your effective patterns as you go across the country? Do you see both the same structure when you're doing the data from WA as opposed to, say, eastern seaboard? How stable? Yeah. Uh, so if we see something that's, that's mafic in Western Australia, would we see the mafic signature in, in Eastern Australia? Yeah, no, I think, I think they, are, they seem to be uh, representative of wherever you are in the country, let me see these, uh, these signatures. Which software package do we use for the PCA? Uh, we use the uh, R statistical package uh, and uh, some sort of custom designed uh, software for uh, doing the visual the visualization. Any other questions? Very well. Um, uh, a small question. Um, greeting. Did you 
do the interpolation with preaching or with any other interpolation yes. technique? Yes, and we went through a very exhaustive exercise of choosing the right semi variogram. It was a challenge at times. How much nugget and, and seal did you? Oh, I can't recall now, but we did uh, variogram maps. So you could see just how robust the spatial signature was. And for many elements, it was quite strong, or components, was quite strong. Some, some of them was quite weak, which you would expect if you haven't got a lot of variance. Or you're close to the detection limit, you haven't got a lot of contrast, you just don't get a lot of, of variance associated with that. So it, it wasn't perfect, but, but we looked at it carefully. Follow it up later. That's all right. I'll follow it up with uh, okay. the translator. All right. Thank you.